with great delight that I join you this morning. Thank you for graciously welcoming me and guiding me through this worship service where we gather to share the connection and opportunity that our faith brings. We gather to experience God's infinite love and grace for one and for all. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this beloved community. Thank you for their pastor, your child, Michelle. Thank you for binding us together in your love that is as colorful and vast as your creation. Open our hearts and minds. Fill us where we are empty. Empty us where we are full. Holy Spirit, inspire and delight us with your love so much so that we leave here with a renewed desire to share your love and grace with our families, with our neighbors, with the world. God, work in us. Change us. Love us until we become your love in the world. We ask and pray all of this in the name of Jesus and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the water. Anytime. Friends, this morning we're going to go on a journey. We'll remember the past, we'll explore the present, and we'll share our hope for the future. To begin, let's start with the recent past. Over the last few months, what has been happening in the life of the United Methodist Church? You can respond. You did really well with the children. <laughs> Reconciliation. Great. Did we just have some meetings? We had general conference. We had annual conference. Yeah, that's right. Recently, both general and annual conferences have met, and we are in the midst of change, and we are setting the course for the future of our beloved church. In May, when delegates gathered in North Carolina, the results of general conference included sacramental privileges for deacons, full communion with the Episcopal Church, these are big things, right? As well as the removal of restrictive language from our discipline and conversation about context and culture interwoven in a larger decision to move toward a regional polity. And of course, the adoption of revised social principles, which include all, all of God's children. In addition to these, Decisions were made with clear-eyed awareness that financial resources and membership have both taken a hit. This leaves us where we are now, with the reality that we, we will have to work together to build a future with hope. We will have to work together to make the United Methodist Church what we know it to be, a place for all people to experience God's infinite love and generous grace. But that's not the end. Last week, the common work was taken to the annual conference, the New England annual conference, where we voted to return land in Vermont to the indigenous tribe from which it was taken. We voted to repair the breach that took money from the sale of historic black churches that was not then invested in those black churches. We voted to provide resources for those ministers who are in the costly process of immigration. We acknowledged and began the deeply needed and long-awaited work of repentance and repair as we named those relationships that have been harmed by sexual misconduct in the church. Not only this, I mean, that's a lot of work, right? But at annual conference, your very own minister, Michelle, was ordained an elder in full connection. Hallelujah, right? 
exciting and exhausting. What a journey. And in the journey and the work of general and annual conferences, these remind me so much of how important our connection is. It reminds me of the importance of relationships. And really, you know, we're taking this journey. You don't have to go very far, and you didn't have to attend either of these conferences to know how important relationships are in our lives. All you have to do is think back just a few years ago to a time when suddenly we were mandated to relate to each other in very different ways. Right? Are you with me? in ways we were neither prepared nor eager for, all we have to do, and I'm inviting you to do this in a safe way and in a safe place, is to think about the shutdown in March 2020. Not a fun memory, is it? When we were staying at home to stay healthy and safe, we began to relate to one another from a distance, right? Visiting with each other in these little boxes on screens. We changed our celebrations to drive-by parties. Do you remember that? We started to know our neighbors differently through driveway happy hours. We were challenged to relate to one another, to care for each other in creative ways. I mean, going to church in your pajamas has some advantages, right? My husband, who's a true introvert, said the only thing he didn't like about shutdown and working from home was that the whole family was there with him. <laughs> Seriously, for many, that sudden life-altering shift was almost bearable with the help of friends and relatives who learned to connect in new ways through Zoom, Skype, FaceTime. My children found joy in this new way of connecting. They had virtual play dates. You remember those? Yeah? Have you ever seen kiddos play hide-and-seek on Zoom? It's an adventure. We all understand what it feels like to be ushered away from others and into a new way of being, whether we want it or not. Ministers also found in this season of church and life a startling new reality. We who mark time with the liturgical seasons found ourselves marked by a season that demanded plans for virtual, hybrid, and in-person worship, community activities, and mission all at once. And foundational to these plans was the overarching concern of health and well-being, mental health and stability, safety at home, and safety at church. Now, I don't have to tell you this, but you already know it, many in ministry are natural caregivers. And the pandemic took caring for others to the extreme, anticipating every need, every desire, every possibility, and weaving it into plan A, plan B, plan C. Being on in this way took its toll on even the most balanced and grounded person. For me, I found joy and relationship and connection and community with others who were trying to figure it out too. In virtual community, I learned how to ask for what I needed. Wow, it took me that long. I learned how to share the ongoing burden of ministry 24 seven when we could not be physically present. I was reminded and could remind others of God's persistently present love and infinitely comforting grace, especially in the middle of crisis. In that season, I cultivated an amazing community, friends who are ministers, friends who are parents, friends who are faithful strugglers, friends who know how hard it is to be a caregiver, friends who let me sing out of tune, hallelujah, friends who pick me up when I'm down, friends who share my laughter and tears, friends who just let me be, friends who encourage, friends who challenge, friends who love me just as I am. Those prophets of the 1960s, you know the ones I'm talking about, the Beatles? They were right. We get by, I get by, with a lot of help for my friends. 
We all do. We all get by with help from our friends. And this is true for the man in this morning's gospel lesson. His friends are the kind of friends we really want to have, right? His friends are creative. They are resourceful. They are determined. Hello. They climb up on a roof of the house where Jesus is healing the sick, and they tear open the roof to lower their friend down to Jesus. Because of their love for their friend, because they care, they're willing to risk their own safety to go up to that roof. And by opening the house for their friend, you know what? They open it up for us. They open up that house for the whole world. You see, when the four friends dig through the roof, Jesus looks up at their dirty, dusty faces and sees their faith shining through. Jesus, scripture tells us, looks up and seeing the faith of the friends said to the man being lowered, my child, my beloved, your sins are forgiven. Did you hear that? Yeah? Yeah. Jesus says the forgiveness and healing of the man is based on faith. Something you expect to hear at church, right? Yeah, you with me? Jesus says that the forgiveness and the healing of the man was based on faith, but not his faith. He was forgiven, healed, restored because of the faith of his friends. And you know what? Not only was the man restored, all of the friends are changed. All of the friends return home transformed, different than they arrived at that house. You see, we all get by with help from our friends. The first August of the pandemic, I left parish ministry. Realizing that all clergy were struggling, I began to live into my vocation in a new way and began a journey of supporting other clergy, assisting and covering for those who needed a break in worship and Bible study while having the much needed space to care for my own family. This commitment to our connection, this lived interdependence, has made me more committed to the ministries of justice, equity, and love. In this, I have found my way onto a new roof. Hallelujah. And today, I stand here with you, not just as an ordained elder in the Methodist Church, but as the Director of Pastoral Care and the Director of Clergy Family Services with the Preacher's Aid Society, an organization that's been opening roofs and helping clergy and their families since 1832. How many of you are familiar with the Preacher's Aid Society of New England? It's pretty important. The society was created at a time when pastors who were retiring, who'd always lived in parsonages, say hello if that uh, rings true, who'd always had a community for whom to care, found themselves without a place to land, without equity to purchase a home of their own, without what is as familiar as breathing for clergy, a community that needed them to show up. The Preacher's Aid Society was born out of the recognition that those who care for others need to be cared for. And so it began to reach out to assist, to support pastors and their families. Interestingly, The issues of the 19th century are the same ones with which we are struggling in the 21st century. And so the Preacher's Aid Society continues this very important work today. We have two affordable clergy housing communities, Wesley Woods at Guilford, New Hampshire, and Wesley by the Sea, you hear a theme there, in Wells, Maine. The society provides retiring pastors affordable places to live. The Preacher's Aid Society also provides for active pastors, just like Michelle, who know the weighty work of ministering day in and day out 
by offering space in the Epworth Retreat House at Dorfield Farm, also in Wells, Maine. This retreat house is offered for one week stays. Can you imagine being in Maine from May through October? And it's offered without cost. Encourage Michelle to go. With grants and loans, Preacher's Aid continues to lift the burden of health care, dental care, emergency assistance, fuel assistance, education savings plans, as well as green energy investment for those who not only care for us, but who care for creation too. Run by a board of lay people from churches across New England, the Preacher's Aid Society cares for those who have cared for us. My role with the society is one that I relish. I have the honor of visiting with over 100 retired pastors and their spouses and listening to their stories. I have the honor of encouraging our connection with one another, including the mission and ministries of our annual conference, and offering resources as needed. I'm honored to receive the wisdom of hundreds of years of committed service and love. And I have the opportunity to give back, to open a roof, to be a friend by showing up, by caring. You see, clergy give of themselves over and over again, showing up for us, whether in celebration of a birth or a marriage or in sorrow with a diagnosis, a divorce, a death. Like the friends in today's passage, our clergy give of their time, they give their energy, they give their resources selflessly. And so now we have the opportunity to show up for them too. Do you know that showing up for one another can be as simple as sending texts each day with a joke or a check-in or a virtual hug? That's showing up. Yeah, yeah. It can be showing up with a cup of coffee or tea and listening to someone who just needs to be heard. It can be showing up like some of our retired clergy who have formed a group to address ongoing gun violence and systemic racism in our communities and what we can do about it right here, right now. It can be showing up for our retired pastors and their families by giving our whole selves in ministries of compassion and care, by offering our gifts of love through the mission of the Preacher's Aid Society. In each of these, we become faithful friends who will not even let a roof stand between our friends and the healing touch of love. This morning, we are reminded that just like the work of the church, born out at general and annual conferences, we are connected. We depend on each other. What I do affects you. And what you do has an impact on me. This morning, our God, the one we know and love, invites us to show up for one another, to care for those who have cared for us, to open a roof, to share our resources, and to connect with God by connecting with others. Together, we make a difference. Together, we are healed. Together, we are all transformed. And so on this journey of faith, past, present, future, we can trust that God's love is found and understood in this. By showing up for one another, we are healed. We are restored. We are made new. By showing up for one another, we are reminded that we all get by with a little help from our friends. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>